So I want to share just a very brief message with you. Uh, last Sunday, we looked at the life of Mary, just sort of as one of the characters involved in the birth of Christ, learned some lessons from Mary. I think one of the mistakes we make, especially those of us who have been around the Bible a lot and know a lot of those Bible stories, one of the mistakes we make is that we, we know these Bible characters in the middle of a miracle. For example, we, we know Moses in the Red Sea, holding his staff up while the children of Israel crossed on dry land, right? We know David in the middle of a confrontation with a Goliath and just a few stones in his pouch. We, we know these individuals in the middle of, a, of miraculous supernatural occurrences. And what we forget, and it's bad that we forget it, we forget that they're just ordinary people. That outside of these miraculous encounters with the power of God, they were just normal people living a regular routine, not very different from, from you and me. And when we, when, when we realize that, we begin to recognize that we are, if we, if, we, if we go about our lives in recognition of the presence and glory and plans and purposes of God, we can be just as available to God as Mary was, just as available to God as the young man I want to talk to you just briefly about today, who was a, the scholars say, 18 to 22-year-old contractor living in the little town of Nazareth. And he's living his life Come on, think about it. I, I, I look around this room and I know many of you and I know many of your professions. Think about the fact that you're in the middle of your life. You're, you're living your life. You're fulfilling the career that you've chosen. You're, you're engaging with people. You're, you're part of a family. Everything is really very, very normal. And you are totally unsuspecting of the fact that God is getting ready to intervene in your life. But you're living a faithful, normal life. That's what I want to talk to you about briefly today. Because what Joseph did not know was in that moment, he's, let's just say 22. He's 22 years old. He's a young contractor with his life in front of him. He learned his trade from his father. He's going to pass his trade on to his children when he, when he has a family. He's, he has no expectation other than this normal life he's living. What he doesn't realize is what the Apostle Paul recorded about that very moment in, J in Joseph's life when Paul says, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son born of a woman. The fullness of time. Listen, we never know when in our family or when in our city or our region or our neighborhood, God has a fullness of time. We never know that. It's not going to be probably quite as momentous as the Son of God arriving because he only does that once the second time he comes he's coming to gather us to himself but there was a momentous world history changing moment about to heaven happen and Joseph is totally unaware of that but he is aware of one fact I'm convinced because especially since we know the children of that day were raised in the Torah, they were raised in the Old Testament, schooled in it. He does know a passage from Second Chronicles that says the eyes of the Lord are ranging throughout the whole earth to show himself mighty or to show his might in behalf of those whose heart is blameless. I want to stop there for just a second because most of us right there will say, well, that doesn't, that, that leaves me out. My heart isn't blameless. Listen, this has been so helpful to me. A friend of mine, former president of Church of God Seminary, explained in the Hebrew and the Greek this word blameless. The Bible says Job was blameless right? We know, we know a lot about Job. We know he wasn't blameless. The Bible, in our understanding of that word, the Bible says Noah was blameless, 
But we know, we know literally Noah had flaws. Dr. Land says this, and remember this when you read scripture. Dr. Land said that word blameless or sometimes translated perfect in the Old Testament literally means fulfilling intended purpose, right? So it, to the example that Dr. Land uses, if you've got a cell phone and the screen is cracked and the case is banged up, but when you hit the, the go button or the call button, everything works. Everything is functioning within its intended purpose. It may be banged up. The screen may be cracked. It may be marred. The case may be marred. But that cell phone is, in the Bible sense, blameless or perfect because it is still functioning exactly in its intended purpose. So the Bible would consider you and me blameless if we know the purposes of God for our lives and we're functioning or surrendered to those purposes, which we're going to learn about Joseph just very quickly here. And the first lesson I want you to go home with from Joseph today is that he's totally unsuspecting of the fact that there are supernatural things about to happen or happening, some of which he doesn't even know about yet. And I want to suggest to you that we're living in a day and age in this country, in this region, where we need God now more than we've ever needed him before. I would suggest to you that the solution for this country, the salvation of this country, is not going to be any one political party or any particular political candidate. Where the only salvation this nation has is if God will send a massive outpouring of the Holy Spirit that restores the church of Jesus to being salt and light once again. And just like Joseph was totally unsuspecting, but uniquely qualified for the task God had assigned him, I want to say to every one of you this morning, in the back row of the balcony to the front row of the sanctuary, you and I may be unsuspecting about God's purposes for you. You may feel disqualified from God's purposes, either because of how ordinary you feel you are or the fact that you don't feel you have many gifts or skills and you're just a regular person. I want you to know you're exactly who God is looking for. And when he gets ready to move in this nation, may he not find what he found in Israel when he said, I looked for somebody to make up the hedge, somebody to make up a spiritual defense for Israel at a time that they desperately needed it, but I could not find anybody. That's what I'm praying God will awaken in us as his eyes range throughout the Seattle region looking for a people through whom he can show himself mighty once again. So I want you to look at a few things with me about how unsuspecting Joseph was and yet what put him in the front and center of the story. And the first is the, is the lineage that he carries. In fact, the Bible says in Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, this is a record of the ancestors of Jesus, the Messiah, a descendant of David and Abraham. Matthew, by the way, has more details about Joseph, the 22-year-old young single contractor in Nazareth than any other of the Gospels carry. Then it goes on to say, Jacob, who was much later uh, Jacob than Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob, who actually is Joseph's father, was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary gave birth to Jesus, who is called the Messiah. So here's, here's, here's Joseph's seemingly oblivious to the fact that his lineage puts him front and center of the purposes of God. And I want you to know your lineage is very likely something that puts you smack in the middle of God's purposes and plans. It may not be a perfect lineage. Your background, you can go ahead and put that slide up. Your background and your, your, your history, your family history, may be, maybe it's wonderful like mine. I have the benefit and blessing of having had a great lineage and upbringing, 
or maybe you've got a very difficult past. Either way, God knows how to take our lineage. You are born to the family you were born in for a purpose, and whether that was a good or a bad experience, God is intending to shape you for his purposes through your lineage. Joseph had a lineage, and you have a lineage. Don't dismiss it. Don't throw it away. Don't, don't, don't be, dismiss it because it might have been a negative lineage. Look at how God is going to redeem that. I frankly think that God has brought some broken people through a broken lineage and uses them as very trophies of his grace and power. So don't dismiss your lineage. Secondly, don't dismiss your birthplace. Joseph had a birthplace and it happened to be Bethlehem. But it wasn't an accident at all because Bethlehem was going to feature pretty, pretty significantly when Augustus Caesar sends a decree that everybody in Israel has got to go to their birthplace and register for the census, which puts then, I'm jumping in the story, but puts Joseph and Mary in Bethlehem at the exact time that Jesus is born to fulfill the scriptures of the Old Testament. Likewise, your birthplace is nothing insignificant. Some of you are born outside the United States and you bring with you a richness of your heritage and your legacy and, it blend, and you're blending it with your neighbors and friends and with Westgate Chapel. Your birthplace is important because nothing about you is accidental. Nothing about Joseph was accidental. Next, Joseph has an occupation. He is a contractor. Notice I didn't say carpenter, even though the Bible says in Matthew 13, 55, then they, the townspeople that Jesus grew up with, scoffed at him and said, oh, he's only a carpenter's son. That word translated carpenter literally in the Greek means contractor because in Jesus' day, in the day Jesus was born, the construction was mostly masonry and some wood. So we know rather than just a carpenter, Jesus grew up with a trade that Joseph inherited from his father of a contractor. And that is not an incidental, that's not an incidental thing because Joseph had a workplace and you've got a workplace. You got a place where you play your tribe, play, ply your trade. And this workplace that Joseph had is a significant workplace because Nazareth is three miles from the huge town of Sephorus. Sephorus is, and I've just recently discovered, archaeologists have just discovered it, it was a massive ruin of the capital of all of Galilee, and it's just three miles from Nazareth. And the, the, the Herod of that time had just issued a decree that Sephorus was to be totally rebuilt. So artisans came from all over Israel and settled in the bedroom community of Nazareth and plied their trade in Sephorus every day, building houses and building these massive buildings. Hopefully we'll get to see Sephorus on our upcoming Israel trip. But his workplace was a significant part of the, the, the purposes of God. And, and lastly, he was also engaged. And the Bible tells us he was engaged to, uh, to Mary, and every one of us, well, not every, maybe most of us in this room, except the single young people over here, have experienced engagement, right? And this is how Jesus the Messiah was born, Matthew 1.18 says. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. And just very quickly, uh, engagement was a signed contract that two sets of parents agreed upon. Parents arranged the marriage, signed a contract that lasted for a year before the wedding took place. And so Joseph is an ordinary young single guy living, working a career, living in an ordinary town just like you when suddenly he finds himself dealing with an unexpected crisis. 
this crisis breaks in on him without any expectation or any announcement because the Bible says before the marriage took place, while she, Mary, was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you are a young man engaged to a young lady and you know you haven't been messing around, a pregnancy is the last thing you want. Because either A, it reflects on you that you have been unfaithful to the arrangement of the engagement, or it reflects badly on Mary that she's been sleeping around unsuspect, unsuspecting by everybody around her. So it's a huge crisis, right? And whenever we're in a crisis like Joseph is, it brings out whatever is inside of us. So what's inside of Joseph? Joseph, this is what qualifies him to be selected by God. What's inside of him? Here's what is inside of him. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man. And he did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. Just very quickly, let me unpack some of this with you about Joseph. What does it mean that he was a righteous man? The word for righteous there in the New Testament literally means to conform to the standard will or character of God, to be upright, to be good, to be just, to be proper, to be in right relationship with God, to be fair, to be honest, and to be innocent. So when this unsuspecting young man suddenly is faced with his first crisis after being selected by God to be the parent who raises Jesus, the first crisis he faces brings out of him what's really there. That's usually what crises do. In our lives, it floats to the surface what has been there all along. And, and, and what we see in Joseph is that he didn't react in anger. He, he didn't lash out. He, he, didn't, he wasn't full of outrage. He, he wasn't embarrassed by what would, how this would reflect on him. Nor did he seek revenge for what seems at all, all intents and purposes to have been a betrayal. He, he, he acted righteously. He was self-controlled. He, he, he was kind. He didn't want to publicly disgrace his fiancée, even though, even though he wasn't quite sure why she was pregnant. He, he was considerate of her in this whole process. He was protective of her uh, because he was going to just quietly break the engagement. And so you see what's in this young man? No wonder God picked him to be the, the parent raising, helping to raise Jesus. There's character in this young man. So he might have been unsuspecting that God was going to pick him, but there's something in his character that is winsome and that drew God's attention. The next thing I want you to see about him is that he's open to the supernatural. It's a lesson we can learn from him. Because on four different occasions, when he desperately needed life direction, God showed up in the form of a dream. The first was when he actually found that Mary was pregnant. And the Bible says an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child in her has been conceived by the Holy Spirit. L listen, I don't know how this hits you, but I've had dreams before. Most of the time, I just dismiss them. But somehow this dream was a supernatural encounter with God. And this young man, not a Pentecostal, not used to the gifts of the Holy Spirit that we are aware of, just a familiar with the Old Testament, somehow is open to being guided by the supernatural. And the angel speaks to him in a dream. Second time it happens is when they're living in Bethlehem, Jesus has been born and the wise men come, attract Herod's attention, and Herod wants to kill all the two-year-olds in Bethlehem. And Joseph has another dream. When the wise men are gone, an angel appears to Joseph in a dream. 
Get up, he says, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother. The angel said, stay there when they're in Egypt until you return because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Then the next time they're living in Egypt with Jesus, right? And Herod's dead and an angel appears. When Herod dies, the angel appeared in a dream to Joseph and says, get up, the angel said. Take the child and his mother back to the land of Israel because those who were trying to kill him are now dead. And the fourth time there's a supernatural intervention from God is when Joseph goes back to Israel and he learns that the area that he wants to go to, back to Bethlehem, is a dangerous area. Joseph learned that the new ruler of Judea was Herod's son, Archelaus, and he's afraid to go. After being warned in a dream, he leaves for the region of Galilee. Each of those four times, Joseph is open to the supernatural guidance of the Holy Spirit. I would suggest to you that whether you're picking a spouse, whether you're picking a career, whether you're deciding where to live, whether there are major decisions in your life, I'd like to suggest to you that it's time now especially, since no decision the child of God makes is an incidental decision, that it's time to learn, if you don't know already, how to listen to the voice of God. How to, t how to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you through supernatural means, by dreams or, or through the word of God or through prophecy or different mechanisms that God has, rather than us just deciding our lives for ourselves to listen to what the Holy Spirit said. Because Joseph would certainly have known this scripture from Isaiah, for, for my thoughts, the Lord says, are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Westgate Chapel, if we're going to be available to God like, like Joseph was, we've got to be open to the moving of the Holy Spirit. And we need to understand that it's not our wisdom and decisions that should be guiding us, but the wisdom of God and the power of God, especially since the life of every believer is now so critical in this nation, like it's never been critical before. The child of God is critical for the future of this nation. And almost lastly, obedience without hesitation is what we learn from, from, from Joseph. Every time the angel speaks, he's gone. From the first dream, when the angel says, take Mary as your wife, he wakes up, he does as the angel commands, and he takes Mary as his wife. When he wakes up from his dream in Bethlehem, and the angel says, get out of Dodge, because Herod's going to kill the children. When he wakes up, he doesn't have, uh, sorry, I did my fault, let's go to the next one. Uh, that night, Joseph left for Egypt and the child and, Ma and Mary, his mother. Joseph got up when the angel says, go back to Israel. And he returns to Israel with Jesus and his, and his mother. And when, the, when he's warned in a dream that, that Judea, is, Judea is too dangerous, the Bible says that he left for the region of Galilee, and that, and which is Nazareth, where Nazareth is, so that he could be safe from the reach of, of, of Herod. Uh, every time the angel of the Lord speaks, Joseph obeys. Those are the lessons we learn. So let me leave you this Christmas with four application points very quickly. One, you never know when God is about to move in your life, in your family, in your neighborhood, in this region, you never know when God is about to move and wants to use you. His eyes are ranging right now throughout the Pacific Northwest, looking for a family, looking for an individual, looking for a church through whom he can show himself mighty to turn this region around and change the, light, the direction of this region. So are you willing this morning. Learn from Mary, learn from Joseph, and qualify yourself to be the kind of person that God would use. Not perfect, not blameless in our understanding, maybe a cracked screen and a banged up case, but available to God for him to use you. Two, 
Please don't allow unexpected circumstances in your life to bring the worst out of you. Obviously, the Lord saw how Joseph would react to the unexpected crisis of Mary being pregnant. That's part of why God chose him. Would we allow the Holy Spirit to so work in our character and our nature that when we face crises, it's not the worst that comes out of it, us, but righteousness because of the power of the Holy Spirit inside. Thirdly, don't make hasty decisions on your own. You have no idea how often in our family conversations in the last three years, Naples, Florida has, look, look, has not looked like a great place for us, right? Nice house on the water, hurricanes occasionally. That's looked just to escape the insanity of the Pacific Northwest. But I'm not trying to be super spiritual when I say to you this morning, I'm not at liberty. I can't just make that decision. It's not just my decision to make. Can I suggest to you, I'm not necessarily talking about leaving the state of Washington, but can I suggest to you that major decisions and direction changes in your life and your family are not just your choice to make? You've been bought with a price. The Bible says you and I are not our own. We've been purchased with the price of Jesus' blood. And the very least we owe him is in a time like this for us to seek him for every bit of guidance and be open to that guidance coming even supernaturally. In fact, I would suggest seek his guidance. Because our Heavenly Father is the one that knows what's best for you and the plans that he has for you. In fact, the Bible says, God says, my plans I have for you are to bless you and to prosper you. Which leads me to the fourth and last one. When you get a direction from the Lord, run to obey. Don't hesitate. Don't argue. Don't second guess what the Lord is asking you to do. But like Joseph, that's part of what I believe pre-qualified him to God's search in that little village looking for somebody that can be a parent and raise his little boy, the son of God. And God saw in Joseph this kind of willingness to obey when once he'd heard from the Lord. May he find here in 2022, at the end of this year and into 2023, may he find a whole congregation of people at Westgate Chapel and other churches that love God in this area. A group of people who are willing to go when he says go. Obey when he tells you what to do. That we would be like Joseph. And, with the eye, and when the eyes of the Lord range throughout the Pacific Northwest, he would find you and me unsuspecting but uniquely qualified to be instruments in the hands of God. Because it's not just pastors God uses and deacons and elders and teachers. God uses everybody. He used a contractor named Joseph in the, in the little town of Nazareth.